Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the first quarterly Councillor at Large meeting. I am Councillor Winthrop Farwell, Jr. I'm joined up here by my colleagues. Uh, Council President Shirley Azak is here with us. Councillor at Large Rita Mendes is here. Uh, Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petronio from the School Department. My colleague and former Mayor, uh, Councillor Moises Rodriguez, and Michael Thomas, the Superintendent of Schools. Uh, this is more of an informal meeting. Uh, those of you who have questions, we will have a Q&A at the end. The Mayor will stop by uh, at some point to bring greetings. This really is part of the Mayor's initiative to have a collaborative and unified and teamwork approach. And for that reason, the Councilors at Large will uh, have different people come in from time to time. We thought it would be important, particularly where BCA is televising this, for our residents to know the different people who have positions in city government. So having said that, I'd like to introduce Council President Shirley Azak for a few comments. Well, good evening, everybody. And th first of all, I'd like to thank my colleagues for inviting me to the um, at-large meeting. As a, as a ward counselor, it's, um, I know that w we have seven wards in the city of Brockton, and you're served by your ward counselors, but we have four very important people, and those are our at-larges that are here to help you with anything throughout the city. So um, first of all, it's my honor to serve as council president for the year 2020. It's, um, I, I can't explain what the city council means to me. It's, um, it's a lot of collaboration, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work, but there is, there, it is rewarding. It is rewarding work even though it's, uh, it's very hard. And um, once again, I look forward to serving this year as council president. <clears throat> as far as the, um, you know, what Council Fowell just mentioned, it's all about teamwork, it's about collaboration, it's about communication and education. So that's what our goal is. Our goal is to work together to make sure that our um, residents, our um, students, that everybody, even our colleagues, that everyone's educated and that, that everybody's working together. And that's what we hope to do. I'm not going to take up a lot of time. I will be here if you, anybody has any questions for me. But um, as with, uh, everything in the city. We have r amazing resources. I hope people take advantage of our website. It holds, it, um, we have information as far as all of our phone numbers, email addresses, um, meetings. We ho there's a lot of meetings in the city, so if residents want to get informed, go check them out on our website, check them out at City Hall, but we have a lot of places where, you know, we have a lot of meetings that people need to get involved and um, informed. So please check that out. Um, my phone number is 508-451-1632. It's always on me. Always feel free to contact me with any questions at all. And I know um, my goal for this year is really to, um, it's communication and collaboration. So I thank my colleagues again for inviting me this evening. Thank you. One of our council at large colleagues just came in and it's Tina Cardoza. And I'd like to recognize some other people quickly in the audience before I invite Chief Gomes from the Police Department to introduce himself. Uh, we have Councillor Susan DeCastro from Ward 4. And we have Mr. Rob May, Director of the Department of Planning and Economic Development. I hope I've hit everyone. And at this point, we will ask Chief Emmanuel Gomes to come up and introduce himself, and we congratulate him on his recent appointment by Mayor Sullivan. Hi, good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manny Gomes. Um, I've been with the police department for, I'm in my 34th year. I grew up here in Brockton. I'm originally from uh, Madeira, Portugal. Um, but I, uh, I've been a resident in the city for a number of years, uh, and I grew up, I grew up here, I uh, went to school here, uh, although I don't, I don't live in Brockton right now, Brockton has been 
uh, deep in my heart and has been for my entire career. It's been an honor to be a member of the Brockton Police Department. It's an even greater honor to be the chief. It really is. This is a great city, and you have a great police department. I'm very proud of those individual officers. Um, I can tell you that uh, working with outside agencies, I once had a friend of mine as a high-ranking guy in the state police who came and worked in Brockton for several months with his gang unit. And at the end of that, he says, I don't know how you guys do what you do with what you got. And, I, and, and that is a reflection on how good these police officers are. But I'm also telling you, can we do better? Yes, should always strive to do better. And that's, and that's one thing that we're trying to do. And as we head towards the summer months, and, we, and as you see, we have spikes in crime. Uh, we have to deal with those things, and we have to adjust on a daily basis. We have officers doing a great deal of many things that we have to do. So looking forward, uh, I'm hoping that you're going to see more officers out in the street, and we're going to streamline the service for, for our constituents and make especially the, uh, the quality of life issues. Uh, we really want to address those things. And, uh, and, and please, I want, I'm going to stick around, answer any questions. I'll be here. And, and please, at any point in time, feel free to call and speak to me about any issue, anything I can do. We will uh, definitely bring that forward. Thank you very much. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass the mic to my counselor at large colleagues to see if they have anything to do. And I'll start with the ladies. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming out. I want to first thank uh, the folks that voted for me and you know trusted me to do this job. Um, so far, it's been a lot of learning, mostly, um, since we started. So a lot of getting to know who the department heads are and who the leaders are in the community and getting to know a bit about the, how everything works at City Hall. Um, it's been a great, great pleasure to serve you thus far, and I hope to continue to do so. And I want you to know, just like I said when I was running for office, that I'm here for you and that I'm available. I'll always try to get back to you as soon as I can, although I'm a bit backed up right now, my phone calls that I have to return, but um, I'll always be available, if nothing else, to listen and to try to get you the information that you need and to try to help you, you know, navigate through the system if you need to. Um, in to reach out to folks that may have the answers that I don't. So just letting you know that I'm available, I'm learning, I'm in that phase, you know, that we still need some time, our newer counselors to get to know how things are going. But I have had folks call out, reach out, email, phone calls, um, and I've been able to help them with their situation. So I'm here for you. I have cards that I'll leave out um, before I leave with my contact information, whatever you need. Um, I'm here to try to help. Thank you. And I'll take questions as well after. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And um, as Tina said, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to be up here and serve in each and every one of you. But one thing I want to tell you is that I want you to be aware and look at each one of us here and to know that you have four councilors here representing you. So no matter where you live in Brockton, you actually have five city councilors at your um, availability to be able to pick up the phone and call. So you know, Tina is backed up, you can always call me <laughs> too. <laughs> so we're here for you and we really mean it because we want to make a difference in Brockton and we're only going to be able to do it if we work together. So I don't want people when I'm going around and knocking on doors telling me that their voices are not heard because your voices should be heard because you should be here speaking up, telling us what you need, telling us how we can help, and we are here for you. So use us, call us, you know, email us, and we're here to uh, do the best that we can and give you an answer and um, be able to get back to you and let you know what things can be done or maybe cannot be done, but at least give you an explanation. So I'm very happy to be 
here tonight and we're going to be here answering questions but most of all we want to listen and hear from you and be able to know exactly how we can help you so that way we're just starting out our journey and to be able to do the best job that we can and be working together as a city to make the city of Brockton a greater place to live thank you so much for everything thank you for voting for me and I really appreciate it thank you Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, good evening. Um, for those of you that know, don't know me, my name is Moses Rodriguez. I uh, took some time away from the City Council for six months or so to be mayor in the city, so I'm back on the Council. But, but what I, I just want to follow up on something that Rita said. Um, listen, if you need to call a, a City Councillor, call the younger ones. <laughs> They've got a lot more energy and they need the experience. So it's okay, Wynn and I will not get upset if you actually call them and they, you want them to do something for you. No, I'm just kidding. I just uh, I wanna make sure that I um, reinforce that whole saying that you do have five counselors no matter where you live in the city and don't be afraid of picking up the phone and, uh, and calling any of us. Uh, don't be afraid of duplicating phone calls if you call two or three and uh, uh, hopefully one of us will uh, get what you need to get done done and, um, and you can have a better life here in the city. Um, we started doing these meetings, uh, what, four years ago? And I think it's been great since we hold them in different corners of the city. And I think the goal is to try to do the same exact thing. Uh, this is one of three that we're gonna, one of four that we're gonna do this year. So hopefully we'll do something in the late spring, something in the summer, and something possibly in the fall. Uh, just to give the uh, Brocktonians an opportunity to come out and just, uh, and, and the goal is just for us to sit here and listen to what the, uh, the folks want us to do for them or answer for them. So it's not to, uh, to be the experts on everything, but also to uh, lend a, an ear and listen to what the concerns are of the taxpayers and residents of this community. So I look forward in doing this and continue to do this. And whatever I can be of help, uh, you know where to find me. Uh, we're on the, <clears throat> as the council president said, our website has a, a gazillion, it's the brand new website that has a ton of new information. It's easier to navigate than it had been in the past. So please use it. Please uh, rely on us as a resource uh, for you. And uh, we look forward to uh, working and helping uh, this city out. Thank you, Moises. The, the principal part of this meeting is to allow our school superintendent, Michael Thomas, and the chief budget officer, Aldo Petronio, to bring us up to speed on the new Massachusetts Student Opportunity Act, which, among other things, which is near and dear to uh, the superintendent and Aldo, it's additional funding for our schools and our children. So. Without any further comment, I am going to turn this over to Superintendent Mike Thomas. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate it. I also want to thank uh, uh, Councillor Cardozo, Councillor Mendez, Councillor Farwell, and um, Councillor Rodriguez for always supporting the Brockton Public Schools. Even long before you became councillors, you were always supporters of the Brockton Public Schools, and I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank former Mayor Rodriguez. Um, I started as interim superintendent in July. And obviously that's when uh, Mayor Rodriguez started as the mayor. So always for the six months he and I spent together, he was always very supportive, uh, very easy to talk to. He and I talked every day, um, and I just, he was a great support. So I thank him for that during those six months, and he continues to be a great support. I also want to thank Councillor Cardozo. Um, if you've read in the paper about our new community center at North Middle School, um, she's on the oversight committee, and... Ever since we started meeting back last summer, um, we started putting this together. And then the oversight committee is made up of all parents, and they m met once a week at least, sometimes twice a week, to build this community center. It's uh, free for all um, Brockton families and students. Um, all the providers volunteer their time. So we encourage people out there to please use the center. It's open Monday through Thursday nights from uh, 5.30 to 9.30 on Saturdays from 10 to 2. So if you can encourage people to come that 
uh, having any struggles or they, they have their children that need help with homework or tutoring, that's available for them. So I thank you, Tina, for, for all your work with that. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we're here to talk tonight about the, the new Student Opportunity Act. It was voted into law uh, by the governor back in on November 26th. Um, this is a long time coming. Uh, we were just short of filing a lawsuit, another lawsuit against the state for their lack of funding to especially urban gateway cities. Um, so it finally came. And this year we ended up with 21 million more in funding because uh, they went back and they finally counted uh, the right way uh, disadvantaged children. So they changed how they counted uh, kids in poverty. So about back in 2016, all of a sudden the state decided that they would count those students differently. So we lost almost 4,000 students by the way they counted them. And that was 16 million in funding. So this new Student Opportunity Act changed that. And I'll have Aldo explain. Um, he's going to go over the cherry sheet quickly with you so you understand the 21 million and where some of that money goes and how much we'll end up with um, in discretionary spending. But I'm happy to announce tonight that the layoffs in the Brockton Public Schools for now are over. Yeah. So not only would that help us uh, reduce class size, which is number one, it will help us start to recruit teachers. It, it will help us recruit diverse teachers because we're not going to be laying people off every year. And when, we, when you lay people off for the last six years in a row, you really you can't recruit anybody because mm -hmm. people, you know, they don't want to come and work someplace where they're going to get a pink slip every year. So uh, that's really hindered us as far as building, especially building a diverse a teaching and administrative staff, which is, you know, one of my major goals. And now that we have funding, we can actually build towards that. And I'll let Aldo go over the funding, then I'll come back and explain more about the Student Opportunity Act. I passed out, um, this came from the, I'm part of the School Superintendents Association. Uh, I'm also part of, uh, I'm, when you're a new superintendent, you have to be in a new superintendent induction class for three years. <laughs> so that's a lot of fun. So uh, they actually gave us this, um, this is a, a Student Opportunity Act over, overview. And this is a really good um, synopsis of the new Student Opportunity Act. That's, it's an easy read. It gets you to understand without all the legal language of the new act. So I have plenty up here if you want to take extras uh, for people that you know. But this is also on our website. It's translated on our website. We will continue to update any information about the School Opportunity Act on our website, and all the documents will be translated as well. So there is a bubble on our website on the Student Opportunity Act, and you can also get all this information there as well. So I'll turn it over to Aldo. Thank you. Good evening. So as the superintendent um, was saying, we were at on the verge of filing a lawsuit. And the reason being is that the urban districts, such as Brockton, Lawrence, Springfield, Fall River, our student makeup is a lot more uh, poor than the, the suburban districts. So the way the formula had been working over the years, it had been failing in covering not only the urban districts, but everyone as far as health insurance costs. It never kept up with what it needed to keep up with. Um, special education costs, the same thing. It didn't keep up with the rising costs to all the districts. But out of those two factors, everybody benefited in the state. But with the other two factors were low-income students and English language learners. Those were primarily the gateway cities. Again, the Brockton, the Fall River, the Worcesters, the Springfields. We were, with the, that was the area, we, area that we weren't being properly funded in. So about four years ago, they changed the formula to where we lost a lot of the funding that went towards the low-income students. So as the superintendent said, we lost $16 million. The state put out a commission to review and find out what the problem was, where it was. They got their recommendations on what to do, but the state had been failing for over four years to act on this. That's what um, led us to get together with Worcester and New Bedford to begin filing a lawsuit. We had law firms that were gonna do this pro bono for us. So literally shortly before we came out with it, they came out with their plan. And their plan was to begin to phase in over a period of seven years, the funding to properly meet everyone's needs. So for the suburbs, it was a little bit of money. For the urbans, it was a lot of money. So they, at that point, um, did the first year, which is FY21, which will begin next July 1st, 
we're seeing an increase of $21 million, and a big chunk of that is primarily because they are now giving us the funding for our lower income students that they had taken away. They had taken it away simply because years ago we did lunch applications and they based the number of lower income students from your free and reduced lunch applications. They went to a new system where they simply took our student database, compared it to the food stamp and this, the mass health databases. Any students that matched up, they counted. Any students that didn't, they did not count. So, as the superintendent said, we lost over 4,000 students, $16 million. Brockton, as we always do, began the fight. And we took the fight all the way to the State House. We brought buses of children in there. We attended meetings there. We met with the Speaker of the House. We met with the Senate President. We met with the Lieutenant Governor. And we fought this issue. And so, they have now come and they've basically looked at correcting the formula. It's not 100% perfect, but it's a big step in our, in our direction. We hope that funding continues year to year, but over a period of seven years, we should continually see an increase, enough of an increase that, as the superintendent said, we hopefully have no more layoffs. So we are now going to begin building our budget on that. The $21 million we received is our gross revenue. What will happen is they'll back out any costs for charter schools, because we have students who go to charter schools. They back out any, char any costs for students that go by school choice to other districts. They give us a little bit of money for our students that come in on school choice, and they give us a little bit of reimbursement for those charter school kids that leave. Either way, we're gonna, from that $21 million, we will end up around $19 million available to spend on the system. I have about 12 million in costs that I've been carrying year to year on things that we've put off. So once we back out the 12 million to move forward next year, we have almost $8 million to begin rebuilding the district with next year. It's actually a pretty good amount of money because we're in, um, we're in pretty good shape uh, across the district as far as the number of students in a classroom. But the superintendent's gonna work at bringing those numbers down to have class size that's controllable. He's gonna look at bringing in a lot of specialty uh, positions such as student adjustment counselors and counselors to work with our kids. And at the same time, we wanna bring back computers. We wanna bring back new books, which we haven't had in years. We'll begin to phase that all in over the year. So the Student Opportunity Act requires us to do a lengthy report uh, that's due by April 1st on how we're going to expend these funds. So we're working day and night trying to get that report done because we just got it last week, the outline, and it's due April 1st. So we'll be putting that plan together and giving that to the state on how we plan on spending these additional funds. And then going forward, we'll follow that plan and we should see success in our system. I'd like to recognize uh, Ward 3 Councilor Dennis Ianiri, who just came in. And we are joined now by the Honorable Robert F. Sullivan Mayor, who was also Chairman of the School Committee. So, Mr. Mayor, would you come up and... The mayor lost 40 pounds, by the way, and I'm extremely 63 pounds. 63. I am extremely jealous, very jealous. Well, good evening. Good evening, everybody. And first of all, I want to thank uh, the counselors at large for hosting this event. This is something uh, that I uh, helped facilitate when I was a counselor at large for 14 years. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for continuing this. It's very educational. Uh, the whole purpose is to hear from you. Uh, and now I'm in a different role. I'm the mayor of the city of Brockton. And one thing that I've said is we're all in this together. We're all elected the same way. We serve two years, city council, mayor, school committee. And I'll tell you this, together, the key words together, we are going to change Brockton for everybody, for the good. It needs to happen. It needs to happen immediately, too. So I just wanted to come here tonight and uh, tell you a couple of things quickly. I, I was a little late because it's the 100th anniversary of the suffrage movement. And Brockton Public Library, it started last week. Uh, they had an event tonight. They're doing 42 events uh, at the library. Um, so again, I encourage you to go there. But one thing that I want to tell you right now that I'm greatly concerned, and each and every one of you greatly concerned as well, is the uptick on violence, uh, gunfire. There was a murder Saturday night. Um, 
The scary thing is, and I know the police chief is here, the scary thing is it's happening in the month of February, cold winter months, that's pretty rare. Um, the concern is, will it increase in the spring and summer? Um, what I'm doing tomorrow night as the mayor is I'm having a round table to try to get a grasp and a handle on it and educate myself. I'm meeting with law enforcement, clergy, and some community activists. After I walk away from that round table, and the city council president as well, after I walk away from that round table, I'm having a stop the violence community meeting for everybody. It's gonna be probably at Brockton High. So it's a date to be determined. We're gonna get a date, make sure that all my fellow colleagues on the city council school committee and superintendent can attend. But I just wanna tell you that it's a scary time right now when there's uh, gunfire in broad daylight at the Westgate Mall. So we need to make sure that law enforcement, state police, Brockton and the DA and the FBI get a real grasp on that. So I just wanted to pass that on today. And again, I just want to thank each and, each and every one of my fellow elected officials and the superintendent as well. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will now uh, turn this back over to Superintendent Thomas. So just uh, quick things about the Student Opportunity Act. This is a, supposed to be phased in over seven years. So it's $1.5 billion that the state is putting into education, K, K to 12. Um, so they really haven't decided from year to year what the funding is gonna, going to be, but they have a commitment to do this through the, the year 2027. As part of the funding, um, the Student Opportunity Act requires the district to do what they call a long form through a, for a three-year district plan. So basically you have to pretty much tell the state, and it has to be approved by the school committee, how you're spending this extra money. And the state wants you to make sure you're focusing and doing a few things well, but you need to focus on your special education students, your English language learners, and students who are falling behind by two or three grade levels. So those are the, the things you need to put your money into. Um, and those, the actually state gives you a menu of items to choose from. Uh, and they're from a variety of different things, expanded learning time, uh, increased opportunity for common planning time for teachers, more social and emotional supports for students, which are adjustment counselors, obviously hiring personnel to lower class size, make sure that we buy curriculum materials and technology that are up to date and not 20 year old textbooks. Um, you're supposed to uh, expand early pre-K programs, which we need to do because obviously we changed our start date for our kindergarten students. So uh, bring a diversity to the education uh, the education workforce along with administrators and then develop an additional pathways to strengthen the college and career. We've done a lot to try to you know, get our kids ready for college, but we've fallen behind getting those kids who aren't going to college ready for careers that are, nowadays are paying a lot of money and we're not preparing our students for those opportunities. So there's money there for that. Part of the Student Opportunity Act between now and April 1st there'll be several meetings like this because I am obligated by the law to hold meetings for stakeholders, meaning you, parents, even though you, some are not parents, community members, residents, so there'll be plenty of meetings that will be advertised, will be on a website, we'll send text messages out to our parents. So between now and April 1st, there's gonna be a good amount of meetings that I have to have to get everybody's involvement, to get everybody's input of you know, parents of all students, teachers, uh, community members, the city council, the school committee, so we all work together to put this plan together. It is required by the law, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, if you have any questions about this, obviously I'm here um, to stay until the end to answer any questions. You can obviously call us, and if I don't have the answer for you and you want a, a specific question from one of our departments, whether it's guidance, special ed, a bilingual department, I'll happy to send you in that direction. But um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into this before April 1st. Uh, they're gonna allow us to tweak the plans as we get into next school year. Um, but again, we're heading in the right direction. For now, the layoffs are over and we can start focusing on what we need to do to educate our students. So I appreciate everybody being here. And again, I'll be here to answer any questions as well. And I, and I thank the councilors at large for, for having me here tonight. I also wanna thank uh, this, the other city councils here and Mayor Sullivan for always, again, their support of the Brockton Public Schools. It's never been, that's never been in question. So we really appreciate that. Okay. Questions for the superintendent or any topic, if, if you would just, come up and I understand you have to pick up one of the microphones and 
speak into it. So if anyone would like to come up and ask questions, please, please do so. We're here to listen more than anything else. And forgive me, I don't think I introduced uh, Ward 6 Councilor Jack Lally. Uh, every time I'm with Jack, they say, there goes grandfather and his son. <laughs> Any questions? The junior counselor. <laughs> no questions. Now, come on, folks. Don't be bashful. <clears throat> Mike. Yes, it's on. Is it supposed to be on? Is it on? There we go. Okay, now it's on. Uh, my question I, I direct to uh, Mike Thomas. Uh, my wife and I have been here in the city for some 30 years. Unfortunately, we don't have any children in the school system, but we're very close to the school system, uh, especially the previous superintendent of schools, Kathy Smith. But I have another friend that teaches in the Brockton school system in the math department, and something recently that she passed on to us, and I really find it quite disturbing, was the use of telephones in the school by the children when they're in class, to the point where they completely disregard the instructions of the teachers and if they're told, if you keep using that phone, I'm going to take it away from you, and you get a reply like, if you touch my phone, I'll kill you. Unfortunately, that reverts back to the sad shape that we've gotten to with, I think, the kids in, in the Brockton school system. I don't know how other to say it, then that way, that's exactly what was told to me. How do we approach and solve a problem like that? It's got to be rampant because all of us, even here is in the, this room right now, have got phones in our pocket. You know, and I hate to see anybody get hurt, but what do we do? Put them. Well, I, I, I don't think that represents the majority of students in the Brockton Public Schools. I know people, um, someone told you a story, and I'm not saying those things don't happen, um, but any, any student that threatens a teacher in that manner would, would be dealt with severely by the handbook. Um, students do have phones in school. Uh, sometimes the teachers are al allowed to use, have the students use those, and some of them have calculators, some of them have graphing calculators, so they could be used for instructional reasons. If it's a disciplinary problem that they won't put it away, it needs to be dealt with by the assistant principal and the principal. So each case is dealt with case by case. Uh, the new discipline law, any, every student is dealt with case by case. We meet with parents, we talk to parents. It, the days of just having a student down and throwing them out of school for 10 days are over. The law changed, so we have to engage parents and try to change behavior. Um, as, but certain laws haven't changed. Any threats on teachers like that, the student would be expelled, um, obviously through due, a due process hearing. But um, there's discipline issues that happen, and we deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis with the teacher and with the administrators. But students are allowed to have phones in school. They're supposed to have them off as soon as they get into the classroom. Sometimes the teachers do have the option to say, turn your phone on, we're going to have you Google something, or we're going to do an activity. But um, it's hard to keep up with the technology in school, but we do. And, um, but s students having phones is a part of, students have a part of life, and we try to use it to our best of our ability as far as the technology goes. But as far as them being disres disrespectful, that's got to be dealt with by the assistant principal. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Welcome. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Would you just pick up the uh, pick up the other one so you can be? My name is. It's on. My name is George Brickhouse, and I consider it a blessing this evening to have all of you that are here at uh, the table, representing the diversity of elements that make up Brockton school political. The mayor being here and uh, Susan uh, DeCastro. My question is a two-part question, and it covers the schools, but it covers the city itself. And also, 
police chief Gomes. First part of the question, and what I'd like to get from each of you is just a yes or a no on it. Uh, do you believe in community policing? That's the first part. The second part is, do you believe that community policing could be helped by junior and senior high school students participating with the police in summer programs to see if, number one, if they might have a desire to focus on law enforcement as a career, and number two, to be in the community, I believe what it does, it enables peers to see them doing something in the summertime that they're getting paid for and also, in the community, it means that you, as a parent, watching over your youngsters, you're not going to let anything go down in a negative manner and not make sure that that youngster is taken care of. And I bring this knowing that it is being done in Boston, and it is being done in Cambridge. And in Cambridge, they've taken a summer program and are expanding it to the entire year. And I equate it with something along the lines of ROTC, that we could have something like that in Brockton. And what it does, community policing means community involvement. And this gentleman's question, I had a student of mine at Brockton High, and as an educational advocate, I went into a meeting with he and his counselor for the fact that he was flunking a class. And I said, why is he flunking? And the teacher said, well, the first thing I have to do is to tell him to take out his earbuds. And as his also basketball coach, I spoke to him in a different way. The teacher and the counselor were kind of a bit surprised. But he said, this is how coach and I relate. And the thing is that it's respect that's needed on both sides. And what we are doing right now, and especially Superintendent Thomas, has got the role of maybe Moses for our schools. <laughs> and, and, and you're gonna have to set, you're gonna have to set the, 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 <laughs> the, the 10 tablets and bring them down. <laughs> you're gonna have to bring the tablets and we're gonna to have to follow because Brockton is a community that can be more and should be more. And Police Chief Gomes, as I said, it's a two-part question. All I need is a yes or a no from each of you and Police Chief Gomes, like I said, I don't wanna take up a lot of time. I just need a yes or a no just to see how you feel. And as I said, it is, I consider it a blessing to have all of you here that represent so much of the political and educational aspect that Brockton has. I appreciate your time. If you expect a yes or no answer from politicians, <laughs> God bless you, man. God bless you. I'll start with the ladies. Um, Mr. Brickhouse, was it Brickhouse? Yes, it is. George Pleasure to meet you face to face. We spoke on the phone uh, earlier this week. Had a great conversation about some things in the community. Um, great question. When Chief Gomes was appointed, um, the first thing we did, Council uh, Woman Mendez and myself and uh, Jeff Thompson, who are the three new folks on the block, uh, reached out to Chief Gomes to address that very question around community policing. I think it's important. I think um, Chief Gomes earlier spoke to how he wants police officers to be more visible. Um, he's definitely on board. I mean, I'm not speaking for him, but we had a great conversation around that. And that's why I think that I'm encouraged by what we're doing here with um, Mayor Sullivan and the school department and all of the leaders in the community, the chief of police. We're all committed to working together to address some of these issues. 
So I'm pretty sure that everybody here is there's definitely a yes to we would like to see more community policing um, and you know address some of those issues that you just spoke about and maybe that model is something that we can entertain you know in the summertime to have students you know um, be in a program like that you know that want to pursue a law enforcement career my brother's a Boston police officer and he's on a bike unit there and Chief Gomes and I talked about that and how that's something that is really important because they're visible on the bikes and the warm weathers in the community so that's some um, that's something definitely that we should consider yes so that is a, a great question because we were really talking about that because that is something that we're very committed and we believe that in order to change a city we have to change um, how the culture views a police officer because it's culturally like in some countries you view a police officer as um, someone that you cannot say no to that you have to follow the orders and a lot of communities they are afraid of police officers but not because of anything that our police officers are doing wrong or that they did that they didn't like it's because what they bring with them and their background and how they view it so by doing the community policing is something that would change that mentality and would educate them that here in Brockton it's different that the police are here to really protect us and to really help us and work with us and the more connected the police officers the police department is with the community the more we'll know about all of the uh, criminal activities going on because that way they'll be able to get back to the police officers and let them know what they saw, what they heard, what they know. If they don't trust the police officers, then that's a big issue. And that's really mainly what I see. We have a very diverse population in Brockton and culturally, we don't really trust police officers in a lot of countries. So here in Brockton, we wanna change that. And by changing, I think the answer is definitely community policing. So thank you so much for the question. We're working on it, we're on board, and uh, we wanna see some changes, so I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, I think we're all along the same lines. Anything that can engage students, I think is gonna be good for them, whether it's community policing, whether it's sports, music, the arts, anything that engages them with, with, uh, with their peers and with the community is going to benefit them, no matter what the, the subject or the area is. George, you probably know I spent over 25 years on the Brockton Police Department. Nothing is more important than a strong police community relations program. You could have 500 or 1,000 officers, and if those men and women don't earn the trust and respect of the residents, the residents aren't going to respond in kind when you need them to help solve a crime, specifically with respect to summer. Uh, it always amazes me that most of the activities for kids are school-based, but yet schools, as you know, get out in June. So we kick kids loose for July and August and maybe the first week in September. And I, I notice one of the points here is an expanded school year. Clearly, there should be expanded school activities. And there was a superintendent we had in Brockton. His name was Manthala George Jr., Matt George. And he looked at me one day and he said, you know when? He said, the best six and a half to seven hours a day in a kid's life is often in the Brockton schools. You don't know what they go home to. You don't know their living conditions. You have no idea what their life is like, but the schools are where, they're, where they thrive. So um, in particular, I think we need to do more for our youth all year round, but especially during the summer months when there's really nothing left for them to do school-based. Absolutely right. So with some of this new money, we will be expanding some of our summer programs. But um, when it comes to obviously community policing, uh, we have school police. We're one of the few um, districts in the state that actually have school police, a school police that are paid by the school department, but they actually are overseen by a lieutenant from the Brockton Police Department and the chief. So they run the great program which is now just came back three years ago, which has been really a really good program. They do that in the summer as well. Uh, the last five offices we, we hired three years ago, they were all Brockton High graduates. They're all in their mid-20s, so they relate very well 
two, they all live in Brockton, they all brought, graduate from Brockton High, they really relate well to our, to our students because they're not much, that old, not much older than them and they've done a great job uh, going into classrooms, working with students, working with teachers, so uh, that's gonna continue to build and I know that uh, Chief Gomes is going to work with us at the North New North Community Center. Uh, having the auditorium available will provide all kinds of opportunities for the police to do different presentations and work with the community and that's a big part of what we hope the community center to be, become. So, um, yeah, Mr. Brickhouse, you're exactly right. I mean, it definitely has to go hand in hand and it's the school department's job as well with, to work together with the police to make sure um, to be part of the community police and, and also getting kids involved. And I actually like the idea of the internships for the juniors and seniors because I think that would go a long way with um, you know, helping students get interested in law enforcement and maybe that's a career path they want to take. So that's actually an excellent idea. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Georgia, I, I too believe in community policing. Um, but one of the things that, I, um, that I've often said is, the, um, is crime is a multifaceted uh, situation that we face in the community. It's not just throwing, and, and Council Fowell said this, it's not just throwing police at crime. Because if we all know that the, the guns that are used in, in criminal activities are not in the streets, they're in homes. And that being said, we have not done a very good job in working with the community to get the guns out of the homes, out of the hands of some of the young people in our community. So I think it has to be a multifaceted approach. We have to uh, get back to basics in a sense. Um, some of these kids are running miles around their parents because of the whole adjustment thing with the cultural swings that exist. Uh, but we have, we cannot forget the fact that we need to have people in places that sound and look like the people that we're dealing with in the community. We need to get people into homes, and I don't mean to break into people's homes, but I'm just saying we need to get people who can, are trusted in the community to basically reach into some of these homes and get those people to help the police out. You can have a thousand cops in the streets. Our streets will be safe in the sense because the cops up and down. But it doesn't mean the community is safe because those guns are not in the streets. They're in the homes. And we haven't really worked with the parents to edu educate these parents to, hey, listen, you need, it's your home, it's your domain. You need to be able to search the homes and make sure that those uh, items that are used in criminal activities are not in the homes. So it's, a, it, it's, not, a, it's not just, well, let's just do community, agree to do community policing but it's the how that sometimes matters. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna go about doing what we need to do to make sure that um, we're reaching those that need reaching? Because just to do it for the sake of it being on paper and existing on paper, it doesn't do much for, uh, for the community itself. So we have to do it a little different. Uh, things that might work in Boston might not work in Brockton. We need to get people around the table that know Brockton, that understand what goes on in the city, to perhaps come up with a solution. The solutions sometimes are within reach, but sometimes we don't take the time to uh, ask those that are affected by this, how would they go about uh, reaching out and, and solving some of the issues that we have. So it's a variety of things that we gotta do, but yes, community policing is a good idea, so as long as we do it the right way, not just to do it so that it's in the books that we're doing community policing. Moses to Continue along with your thought, if you don't mind. As I said, I don't want to take up a lot of time. Uh, you can want to come up, sir, so you can be on. Uh, yeah, why don't you take this one? This one, this one sounds a little bit better. As I said uh, earlier, I do consider it a blessing to be able to chop it up and to have dialogue in the community. I, I, I mean, I'm really appreciative of the time. The student that I was making reference to with the earbuds, with his teacher, uh, the class that he was flunking was film, film studies. And film studies consisted of watching a film and doing a one-page paper. But he was flunking because of the earbuds and the fact that he wasn't relating. So after we had that 
discussion and the earbud piece was uh, taken out of the mix. The next film was going to be Get Out. And my response was that if you don't get an A on the film Get Out, then you and I have some serious problems. Afterwards, he and I went to Frank's to get something to eat. And during our time at Frank's, he jumped up on his side of the table and said, they're not teaching me and helping me with anything that I need to get through in my life. And so what Moses was saying, I point out, I have a 501c3 program called Dare to be Great. Part of the program is going into homes. I know that teachers cannot, don't have time, but part of the program is going into the homes. I've gone into homes and had parents say, Coach, what are you doing turning off the television set? I didn't come here to watch television with you. I came here to talk about your youngster because it's 100% we have to be somehow involved with the parents. We have to. One of the things that uh, Councilwoman Cardoso and I were talking about through the community center was what I'm looking at doing is a sixth grade program. In the sixth grade, the reason is that parents have to drop off and pick up their child. So while they're doing that, the opportunity is there to also talk with them about what's going on in the home. Because the home has to be the basis. It isn't the teacher's responsibility to raise a child. It's the teacher's responsibility to help educate a child and to advance his knowledge and his understanding. It's the parents in the community. It takes a village. It takes a village. And Brockton has that opportunity to be the village. And as I said, I, I really, you were 100% on point. It's got to start in the homes, and we have to find some way to do that. And as I said, I just consider it a blessing to have the conversation this evening and the chance to chop it up with you in terms of what what's going on in George Brickhouse's head. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adius Pierre and I'm very happy to be here tonight. And I'm just going to say congratulations to all the elected officials. Congratulations to you, uh, Superintendent. Uh, congratulations to uh, Chief Gomes. Uh, it's, not, it's not a question, it's not a comment that I want to make. Uh, this is a very important for the community to have a good meeting like that. However, we don't have a lot of people here. I wonder how you guys do the advertising for that meeting. Because where to find people, you have to go to the churches. You can send uh, uh, the invitation to the churches. And send the invitation with the kids. Because not everybody has access to social media. I found out last night on Facebook from Enterprise. So, but some people are working now. And I, I was wondering too, if today is a good day to have that meeting. Would you consider to have another day like Thursday uh, or maybe Sunday? I don't know. But I think, like uh, the superintendent just said, we're going to have more meetings like this. So, next time, think about other folks, uh, where to find them, because the meeting is for them. That's all I want to say. Go ahead. Oh, microphone, okay, yes. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Adius. That's a great point, and I was going to um, bring that up. I see my buddy Adriano Cabral back there, and I see Eva right there, two folks in the media. And I was actually on Eve's program this week um, in Randolph, so I'm happy that you all are here because this is a great way to get information out. Although this is in English, um, I'm happy to come on programs to explain some of the stuff. That's why I'm taking all these notes. <laughs> and then bring, hopefully, a translator, a person along to help. Because I think, like you said, Addie, a lot of our older folks, they don't 
Um, they're not on social media. So the radio, the television programs are very important in getting this information out. I think we need to do more of that. And then as far as, you're right, we need to meet people where they are. So the churches are super important. Um, I've always said that. Um, that we have to have a better connection with the churches. It's a great way to disseminate information. So there's work to be done around how we communicate in the city and how we get information out. Thank you for um, Brockton Community Access. They do a great job in putting information out there. But again, it is in English, so we need to be able to talk, you know, to have it in Haitian Creole and in Spanish. Inez is here too. Thank you, Inez. Um, get information out there in Spanish and um, Cape Verdean Creole and in Haitian Creole. So we have to do a better job of that. And you're right, maybe find a different day that people um, are more available to come out. So these are all things that I think about a lot in, in trying, because I run my own programs and it's always a challenge to get people out. So trying to find savvy ways to get people more engaged. I know Eva's doing the census and she's been going nuts trying to find ways to get people engaged. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge for all of us and the demographics here certainly has changed and we don't want the same people coming to these programs. We want more diversity, more folks coming out and listening and we want to find better ways to get the information out. So yes, we have some work to do in that area. Hi, Adias. I just want to say I, I completely agree with you, and I agree with what Tina said too, because we definitely need to get some interpreters to these meetings and have uh, other cultures and people in, also in the city to be involved and to be here and get the word out there. So we have to do some work on that, but at least they can watch on YouTube or TV. And um, yeah, but that is a good point. We definitely need to do something better. <laughs> Thank you, and I just, I don't mean to interrupt, but I did want to uh, make a comment for Mr. Brickhouse. I, you brought up a, um, a very good uh, subject, which is community policing. As everybody mentioned, everybody's in support of that. I know we've been advocating for that for years now in the city, so hopefully we're going to come together and with uh, Chief Gomes and really get it get it going in our community, because that's really what we need. Um, I did want to mention, that Brockton Police does offer a Brockton Youth Academy for students in the middle, um, I believe it's in middle school because my daughters were able to participate in it. It's an amazing program run by the Brockton Police in collaboration with the Brockton Schools where they teach students um, to become police officers and, and um, not really like police officers, but it, it, they teach them about um, what a police officer really does and what they are in the community and how they, um, what their actual job is. I will tell you, it's, uh, I believe it's a few weeks. I, I don't know, the, it's been a while since my daughters were in uh, middle school, but um, they, the students leave there respecting law enforcement, respecting the police, and it's a great program, and I know it's still going on because I do hear about it. I don't know how often or who's running it at the time. I believe it was Officer Le uh, Liedberg who was um, involved, but um, definitely get, get the students involved in that, and if we need to do funding um, to help it move along, I'd be more than happy to work with my colleagues. So. Um, it's the, the programs are out there. We have a lot to offer in Brockton. It's just a matter of getting the information out to everybody. Thank you. I think because of the points made, the, the four of us uh, should get together before our next meeting and we'll map out well in advance how we can get more information out to the community. And uh, uh, I'm going to. I can help with you. you can, Adius can help us. I know we have bilingual police officers. Uh, the chief might be able to bring one to one of these meetings. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to recognize State Senator Michael Brady, who took time to come in and join us. <laughs> and I'm going to put the chief on the spot before we go to the next uh, question. And uh, Chief, you were, uh, I remember when you came on to the police department, that's I guess that really dates me, but talk a little bit about community policing, and I remember Officer Luciano and all that he did, so. Um, all this conversation about community policing, first and foremost, I want you to know that 
we're more committed to it than ever. Um, these councils, I, I can only echo what they said because it's absolutely true. The police department can't do it alone. I'm the first one to tell you that some of the things that we're dealing with, we can't arrest our way out of it, okay? It, it, that's just not the way it's gonna work. To eradicate some of the problems, it's gonna take us working with other groups and, and bringing these things to fruition. Um, some of the things that I heard here, uh, we, we do have programs for the kids. I'd like to see more um, because I truly believe that a, a kid that's busy is a kid that stays out of trouble. All right, I, I, on the job, all the years that I've been here, I've seen a lot of kids at the booking desk. They weren't bad kids. They just had a lot of free time, and next thing you know, they're in a bad place. And I think everybody here knows what I'm saying. Um, so I'd like to see more of that. I really would, especially in the summer months, um, because the days are longer, the kids are out later, the weather is good, all these things. Uh, I'd like to see that. We do offer a lot of programs. We're already committed. We do a lot of things that you might not know about. We already have officers that go out with uh, probation officers and, and uh, school officials, and, and we, we, we check on kids on their curfews. Uh, we check on people in this city if they're on parole or if they're a young kid. We do, we do house checks on a regular basis with a lot of organizations. I mean, we're actually going to houses making sure that the kid is in for the night, making sure that he's doing what he's told to do. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we're partnering um, with other agencies on this. Um, but like I said earlier, can we do better? I, I, I want to hope so, and I, I want to strive for that. All right? Thank you. Uh, I want to add there's a program called Handle with Care. So we work closely with the police department. So if something happens at a child's home, um, the night before uh, a domestic violence incident, for example, and unfortunately a, a, a mother or dad are arrested. Um, the police will get a hold of the school if there's a, a school-aged child and tell them handle with care. They cannot give specific information about what happened in the home, but it, uh, it makes the, the school adjustment counselor, the principal and the assistant principal and the teachers aware that, you know, please handle this child with care today, that they had a tough night so when they come into your classroom and they're chewing gum or they don't have their pencil, let's, you know, you know they're having a hard day and they have their head down, let's, you, you know why something happened. Again, you don't know the details, but it's a program that's worked very well and, and it's constant communication between uh, the police department to the school police department and then they relay uh, the information to our adjustment counselors, our principals, and it's called Handle With Care. So that's where it really worked really well. Uh, my question for the superintendent. Uh, um, I, I'm, my name's Steve Kelly. Uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, I, I represented the welfare department on a dropout prevention coordinating council. I think Mo was on it with me. Uh, you know, Councilor McGarry was on it. It was basically a, a coordinating council that work at helping out at-risk youth that involved all this full, you know, the state agencies, Massasoit Community College, Bridgewater State College. We had an alternative junior high school. We had a business mentor program. We had a college mentor program. And that went on for 10 years. You know, it was funny. We ended up stopping because the budget crisis, we had foundation money. It stopped and it went out. Well, unfortunately, at the same time, I also got a promotion and started working in Boston, so I couldn't follow up on it and work on it. But I really want to see us bring that back, because it really worked. It brought together all the state agencies, and a lot of times there's programs that the state agencies have that can help us out working in the community. You know, one of the things I got done with that is we were talking earlier about the teen parent program. I was able to put daycare in place that really kept that program running. You know, and that went on, it's still going on, and doing really well. You know, I, through that program, I got kids that were on the verge of dropping out of school through college. I had one kid that ended up going to Bridgewater State, and then 15 years later, 
you know, I needed her. I basically had my car was, you know, broken down. I bump into her in, in a restaurant and got a ride home for her. She's now a homeowner. She's working as a social worker. So this kind of stuff works. You know, I was up in Boston for a meeting on education reform that Deval Patrick had. We even had Phil Johnson, who is the you know the, um, the Department of of um, Health and Human Services for the state. You know, I went up to him at the meeting. And I said, "Do you remember when you came down to Brockton?" And he, yeah, he did. He said it really worked. So I'm wondering if we could bring something back like that. So we have several summer programs. Uh, we work with DCF. We, I, have a, um, I have 15 community mentors that work with the school department that run some, some programs. So we have about 3,000 kids, at-risk kids, that take part in several summer programs from K to 12. So those things, at, maybe the agencies have changed, but the programs have not gone away. Um, we do get, still get grant funding. Our community schools programs run a lot of uh, um, activities. We have a, um, a, a summer program for middle school just for females. That's really when um, uh, it's called the CHOMS program. That was 150 middle school females running. Uh, it was a program that happened at North five days a week. We still have the Brockton After Dark program, which is run by the, um, by the mayor's office. That's, that still goes, and that goes at night at, at different schools. Uh, we have a male program from 6 to 12. We had 300 students involved in that um, last summer. So there's still several. There's... There's several that I'm forgetting, but we still though, uh, several of those programs are still running. A lot of it's through grant funding. Uh, some d the agencies have changed, but obviously we're always looking to expand. And I appreciate everything you did to help with the Project Grads program years ago because it is still going strong and it's a very vital part of the Brockton Public Schools. Good evening. Um, going to shift gears a little bit okay um, we just had a tax increase or the last tax increase um, personally our taxes went up about 600 bucks a year where we live okay um, now I believe there's a, a uh, proposal before the ordinance committee for a user's fee for the water and sewer this user's fee is going to amount to $200 a year flat fee all right I um, wonder if the counselors up here and in the audience would care to comment on it. I think I'll defer to our most recent mayor, Moises Rodriguez. <laughs> I think I'm going to defer this to... <laughs> well, one of the things that um, we have been looking at is, um, and, and by the way, I want to make sure that we, we talk about this a little bit. Our taxes didn't go up. The value of the property went up. We actually lowered taxes. I know sometimes it's hard for people to understand that, but the, per, the, the dollar per thousand actually went down a little bit. And actually, this is probably the lowest tax rates that we've had in this city in a very, very long time. We lowered the business taxes and the commercial taxes, as well as the residence taxes. But the fact that your taxes went up, in a way, it, it, it's good and bad at the same time. It shows that your property is doing well, but it hurts your pocketbook a little bit. But I just wanted to make sure that people understood that we did not raise taxes. We lower taxes. The property values went up. As far as the, um, the water rates are concerned, uh, we had a long deliberation over this. Um, I don't know if you know this, or at least the people who are watching us at home know this, but our water and sewer infrastructure in this city is in shambles. We are one click away from not being able to have water in our city for days, if not months. Our sewer pipes are over 100 years old, and they need to get fixed up. I mean, you see them popping up here and there, here and there, but we need to put a serious effort into doing this. And one of the things that we thought about is that it wouldn't be fair for the general population to pay for this, the water and sewer. 
That's why we came up with this idea of implementing a rate um, increase, not a rate increase, but a, a user fee within the, the water users to help us dig into this massive issue that we have that's called the infrastructure that we have. We're looking at uh, somewhere around $60 million worth of uh, repairs that need to be done and replacements of piping in this city. But the good thing about this is that as we go along and start replacing uh, these water and sewer systems, we'll also be able to do the streets. So it's a twofold effort, you know. Uh, we're actually asking the community to, to hang in there with us and help us out as, as they possibly can. Uh, the rates aren't across the board. It's actually going to affect the ones that actually have the higher user of water and sewer uh, than the, the seniors and the folks who are in fixed income, in the sense, because we were cognizant of that to make sure that, that those numbers stayed as low as possible. But to be honest with you, we don't have the resources that some of these other communities have. And in order for us to go ahead and try to do the things that we need to do to be able to provide the services that we have in this community, we have, trust me, I'm a, I'm a resident of this community as well. My taxes went up as well. You know, and my sewer and water rates are going to go up a little bit as well because it's not like the elected officials can kind of scur away from, uh, from those rate increases because it doesn't, we, we can't avoid that. But, the, uh, but trust me when I tell you, I've wanted these guys that I've, all, I've always voted against tax increases since I've been a city councilor. But it gets to a point where you look at, you gotta be realistic. You know, the sewer and water pipes aren't gonna fix itself. And, and if we don't start taking small bites out of this thing with the small uh, user fee, we're never gonna be able to do this. And again, we are one click away from catastrophe. You know, if those, you remember what happened a couple of years ago with the water pipes in East Bridgewater. Our water comes from, um, from Pembroke and it travels throughout that region. By the time it gets to, to Brockton, it comes a long way. So we are risking, risking going without water in this community if we absolutely do nothing about this. And the only thing we can do that we can think of, we, could, we came up with, is either beg for money and nobody's giving us anything because we've been begging for a while but we felt that we needed to do something within our own city to be able to put in a small increase. Again, calculated increase, not to hurt uh, the most uh, vulnerable folks, but to come up with a small increase so that we can kind of start tackling that issue with, uh, with, the, with the water pipes in our community. We have areas in the city that they, they have absolutely no water pressure because those pipes are now, you know, when they were six to eight inches, they're now probably down to an inch or so of water coming through them. You know, and that's also not fair to individuals who are paying for water and sewer in this community. So I know we're taking a hit on this because nobody wants to increase this, and I personally do not want to do this, but trust me, we had absolutely no choice but to do this. Absolutely no choice to do this. And every single thing that we raise out of this, uh, uh, these uh, user fee increases are going to go into the infrastructure of the uh, of the pipes and uh, of the pipes and the and the sewer in the city. Hopefully, I, I try to answer it as best as I possibly can. But again, that's just the way uh, that's just the way we are. It, and again, I don't. I'd rather pay something now than go without water for weeks at a time because we know how dangerous our you know how overworked the whole system is in this community and we are we are an old city it's been around a while we haven't done anything about it you know we have pipes that are 100 years old you know and we got to do something about that thank you <coughs> don't don't go and say some of the things that i've said <laughs> no i might go in an entirely different direction i don't know i uh a couple of things. A user fee by any other name to me is a tax. Frank, I don't know where you, you, you went. I, uh, so, look, I'll keep an open mind out of respect to Commissioner Rowley and the Chief Financial Officer. I'll listen to what they have to say about water and sewer rate increases and user fees. Uh, I do want to know, however, what are we charging the other towns for whom or uh, for which we provide water. I want to make sure they're paying their fair share at the same rate, and I'm not sure they are. 
The other thing I've asked the DPW to do is to tell me who's not paying their water bills. If we have $2 million in unpaid water bills because people are just saying, lean my property, lean my property, lean my property, I'm not going to pay it, that seems unfair. If everyone else is struggling with their family budget to pay these quarterly water and sewer fees, it seems to me everyone needs to be part of the solution and not make only a certain percentage of people part of the solution. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would not uh, say that this is a done deal yet. I, I wouldn't. Uh, the last thing I would say is we, we can never lose sight of the fact that in this city there are people who live paycheck to paycheck, who live Social Security check to Social Security check. They've earned their Social Security benefits. They don't have a lot of excess income. So it's just not a little bit of a nibble on the tax rate, uh, the taxes that are paid, and a little nibble on the water and sewer rates. The, the cost of food goes up. The cost of homeowners insurance goes up. The cost of car repairs go up. And if you put that together in the aggregate, if it's too high, you're going to force people out of their homes. You're going to force them into another town. And, and I, I am super cautious when it comes to these proposed rate increases until I am absolutely sure that we've made the least amount of increase that we need to and that everyone is paying their fair share. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot more research and study that has to be done in this before we grab at, at user fees. Uh, with all due respect to my council colleague, whatever he said about the, the infrastructure needing repairs, he's right. How we get there is, is um, as one of my colleagues would say, we've got to sweat the details. We have to sweat the details. Would the ladies care to chime in, or do you want to? I, I, I don't blame you a bit. Uh, <laughs> Dennis Hersey, taxpayer, homeowner, voter. I get a little upset sometimes when I hear some negativism about Brockton High School, being a graduate of it and being in the Hall of Fame there. Brockton High School is one of the greatest high schools in this country. I put it in the top 10. You have 4,300 students up there. And I'm gonna say this in all honesty. There's probably only 100 at the most that are really disruptive. The rest of those kids are good kids. All they want is a chance to get that high school diploma so they can go out and join the military or go to some institution of higher learning and take their place in society. I wish you people could have seen the great music performance, the Christmas performance. I don't think there was a high school in the country that could have matched that. We recently had some plays at the high school, the winter plays in the drama department, outstanding. We got a basketball team that's on a roll that's got a chance to win the state championship. No matter what program there is at Brockton High, a kid can get the best. The best. All he has to do is apply himself. So I, 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 I love having been to Brockton High School. I could tell you that because of it, I didn't have to pay for college. I got a full ride. Maybe I earned it, I worked hard in high school, but I earned it and a lot of other kids there get full rides too because it's a great high school. Let's not forget too that this city, Chief Gomes, on the, the population of this city, he's 28 police officers shot. I hope our city council over the next year gives you those 28 police officers because I know how much it will help. We really are down in numbers, in our fire department as well. And we have a great fire department. And our police department is doing an incredible job with the lack of police. They're doing an incredible job. I want to say something about the new money that's going to come in, which I think is great to the school system, because Moses, you probably were a product of this. Did you ever have a Cape Verdean teacher when you went to Brockton High? Right? See? And we have kids who never, who are Spanish, who never had Spanish teachers. We had kids who, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Kids who are Afro-American, they never had an Afro-American teacher. But now that's going to change. What I think is great, because kids need ident to identify with people. They need mentors. And this is one thing we really, really need. So I made my comments. I'm just going to ask a question now, and I'll get out of here. 
I'm hearing, well, all you're doing is building apartments, apartments, apartments in Brockton. And we're not bringing businesses into Brockton for jobs. We just had something fall through the other day on uh, down off of Main Street. We were supposed to have a restaurant and a brewery there. They pulled out. Now I'm hearing the rooftop restaurant is not going to work. Nothing's going on there. We need to have some industry. We need to have some type of entertainment. We need to have to come to Brockton. Our Shaw Center and our Rock Stadium are a mess. Believe me, it's a mess. They need to be totally redone. So my question to you is, what are we doing about entertainment to Brockton besides building apartments, apartments? I thought the city council meetings were the entertainment. I, <laughs> I, I guess we need to expand a little bit. Uh, I, I, I think given the fact the mayor just took office, uh, we, we've got to give him a chance to work with Mr. May from Department of Planning and Economic Development, uh, work with us as a council because we each bring our own interests and, and uh, peculiarities to economic development. Uh, and I think over time you'll see a more condensed and perhaps focused approach to economic development. It's, it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but I think we have all the right people in the right places to make a difference. I don't think housing is the ultimate answer. I think you have to have a blend of different projects, some of which would generate jobs because we want our kids to be able to work while they're in high school and earn money towards college and then have something to come back to after they, uh, after they finish their college or if they're at Massasoit. So I think the answer to this is stay tuned, new administration, new council, new team effort, new collaborative approach, new outreach to the community, including the business community, and let's revisit this in five or six months and, and see where we are. Uh, I do think some of the projects that are already underway need to be continued. Uh, we have state funding in place. Uh, I think we'd be foolish to cast them aside, but um, let's, let's give everyone a little chance to get their feet wet, so to speak, get focused, and then go forward from there. And I don't know if... Thank you, Dennis, for your question. Uh, on top of what Wynn said, and we're, there's a lot coming up. I was just at a meeting yesterday on the CSX project and some interesting data that came out of that. But the thing that I'd like to see is the businesses we already have, I'd like to see them thrive. And I'd like to see more educational opportunities for business owners to expand and to, you know, to, to help their organizations, their businesses thrive in the community. Um, having sat on zoning and um, the folks that come in front of us, there's, there's a lot of education that's needed when they bring projects in front of zoning. And I feel like um, we as a city need to, to kind of foster that, you know, to help businesses so that they can thrive, so that they can have more entertainment and more, you know, better food, better restaurant, better services. So besides working with, you know, besides building and economic development, we need to focus a lot more on what we already have. I think there's, there's something to be said about that. You know, let's rally around the businesses that are already here to see how we can support them um, and support folks from the community that are trying to build as well. Okay? Does that help some? We're getting to 8 o'clock, so I think we have uh, one of our last questioners here. Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for holding this meeting. And I hope we can um, make this a tradition and have it for, for uh, years to come. Uh, so I'm a therapeutic mentor. My name is Nelson Fernandes. And I work with the youth in our community. And what I've noticed is, is that there is a lot of um, youth crime in the city. That's, that's what I've noticed. And we're losing a lot of, a lot of uh, young folks in Brockton. So my question is, 
uh, what plans, and I'm gonna pose this question to all of you guys, what plans do you, do you guys have when it comes to reducing the youth crime and also drug addiction uh, by the youth in, uh, in Brockton? Well, um, I'm, I'm gonna throw this out here because uh, this is uh, up my alley. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we're in the process of getting a couple soccer fields built in the city. Uh, something that we've been uh, working at for the, I don't know, since I, since I came to this community some 40 years ago. We haven't really done much in terms of developing what we could within the communities that we have. So we're looking at uh, right down the street here, putting something that's artificial turf with lighting so kids can actually have access to it during the day and also in the early evening hours. There's gonna be another one up in the, uh, in the north central uh, side of the city as well, just to give the young people more opportunities. Um, the issue with, uh, with the opioids that we have in this community, uh, I don't know if you remember when I first came into, uh, into the mayor's office, one of the things that I wanted to do is bring the stakeholders together to discuss the issues of the uh, opioids, the overdoses, and also homelessness. Uh, because, you know, although what you see out here is a Brockton issue, a Brockton problem, but it's not really just a Brockton, Brockton only issue. Uh, the vast majority of the, um, uh, of the folks that we have who are involved in, uh, in overdosing and um, in, in issues of, um, uh, in the opioid issues, or even homelessness when you think about it, are not folks from Brockton. They're folks from the surrounding communities that come into our community for services and they end up staying. You know, so we gotta, we gotta look at this whole thing as a regional effort. We can't do it alone. I mean, I know it's, uh, it, it, it's almost, it almost sounds good when we say we gotta have more police, we gotta have more fire, we gotta have more teachers, but I don't want my taxes to go up. I don't want the rates to go up. And, and those two things don't jive. You know, either you're gonna increase some things or decrease some other things. You cannot continue to uh, we have the men and women in, mili in, the, uh, in uniform that are given two or three percent raises on a regular basis. And if you give them those raises, you have to raise taxes to compensate the, to make up the difference. You know, so that's why it's important for us. I know as politicians, we're, we're supposed to, to preach the no new taxes or no increasing taxes, but increasing services. You know, that is actually you know, hypocritical in a sense because it doesn't make any sense. We can't sit here and say we need to put more 40 or 50 cops in the streets and at the same time saying, well, my taxes went up by $200 or whatever, and we can't do that because those funds have to come from somewhere. You know, and it's also important for us to remember that we as a community have not done a very good job advocating for our own community. I say this all the time, and I'm going to say it again. The worst enemies of Brockton are Brocktonians. We go around, people that work for the city, people who are police officers in the city, firefighters, politicians, you name it, badmouths this community on a regular basis. You know, so it's kind of hard for a business to move into Brockton when we have people in high places talking, excuse my French, crap about our city. So we don't do a very good job. We don't spend any money in, in advertisement. We don't spend any resources in campaigns to bring people and business into, into our community. But we want things to change. How, does that, how is that going to happen? When we've got people that say, oh, you know, uh, one kid in the Brockton school system did this. Well, it's one kid out of 18,000 kids. I mean, let's put it into perspective. Of course you're going to have those kinds of problems when you have you know, 4,600 kids running around in the, uh, in the hallways of Rockton High, once in a while you're gonna have some issues, but you gotta take it in stride in the sense to realize that we are a city of 100,000 plus people, and those issues do happen in cities this big. You know, so, you know, if it was helping, you know, it happening in Avon, it should be a problem. But in Brockton, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a problem, but it, you need to understand that we are a city of 100,000 plus people. But we need to become 
a bit more cheerleader, a lot more of a cheerleader for the good of Brockton because we don't do a very good job in cheering for the city. We sit here dwelling on the negatives, dwelling on the issues. Uh, there was a shooting down here, <clears throat> but we don't take the time to say, well, the shooting was actually committed by somebody from Boston or somebody from Stoke or somebody from someplace else. It, it's labeled in the city, but we don't sit here defending the city as we should. And I think that's one of the things that I've always said that Brocktonians, to some instances or to, some, uh, to, to a certain level, are the worst enemies of this city in terms of not promoting this city in the eyes of a lot of people. How is business, how is a business going to move to Brockton if I'm sitting there in a room bad mouth in the city? How are they going to do that? You know? So we need to be a little more positive about this and realize that, you know what, cities have city problems. We do have problems that cities have. You know, uh, when you're the only city in the middle of 27 communities in Plymouth County, you're going to have city problems that you shouldn't expect in Plympton or in some of these other smaller you know, towns that we have. But we need to start promoting this city a little bit better. And I think it takes every single one of us, residents, uh, elected officials, city employees, to do that in a positive sense to promote this city. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it for us. I think the business question was before that one, before Nelson's question. <laughs> so Nelson, to answer your question, our kids are traumatized, okay? So we need to address that trauma. Um, uh, we had a couple incidents here where a couple kids died. You remember when those two kids in the car accident? I reached out to Mike Thomas that next day. Those are two huge families in the city, right? And a lot of those kids, including my daughter, they were mourning. They were really upset about that. Um, those kids had to go to school the next day. And Mike and his staff had to deal with that, you know? So I said to Mike and to the mayor, we need to put together some kind of task force to look at how we address trauma. Because these kids are traumatized over and over on social media, on TV, when these deaths happen, when these you know, shootings and everything else. We have to address that. We as adults have to make sure that we're caring for these children that are witnessing this. Okay, so I think to answer your question, we need to do more. Mike, I'm sure, is on board with this, with more adjustment counselors, more school-based therapy. Adriano, we talk about that all the time. We need to, you know, come out when these things happen and make sure that somebody is speaking up and talking to parents and going out to the homes and reaching the young kids. And then when they're in school, offering therapy. In all other suburban communities and everywhere else, when something like that traumatic happens, they send counselors out to people's homes. They do it in Boston. They do it everywhere. We don't do a good job of that. And if we don't address the trauma now, what hope is there for the future? Um, the other thing is, as far as the opioid epidemic, we get funding in the city um, to address opioid. But the big problem that we have in our communities is really alcohol and marijuana. The kids are all smoking marijuana. They're all vaping. You know, we need to do more educational programs for our children around marijuana. We need to address alcohol that leads to domestic violence. Those are the big issues that we have in, the, in, the, in our community. I'd like to see more um, AA programs in Haitian Creole, AA programs in Cape Verdean Creole. You know, we don't have those things. And more education around the dangers of marijuana and vaping in our youth. So some of that funding, I'd like to see go towards that. When Moises was mayor, we accepted a, a state statute that transitioned Brockton from a Board of Health to what I hope will be a Department of Health and Human Services. It will allow Brockton to have a Commissioner of Health and Human Services. Under that person, there will be the Board of Health, and there will be the Commission on Women's Issues, and the Veterans Services, and the Council on Aging. It will allow us to, I hope, aggressively pursue grants at both the state and federal level. It, it literally will take us from operating like a town with a Board of Health to a major city. 
And with that department, if it passes uh, through council approval, then you can do outreach to all of the different communities. You can have uh, different pamphlets in different languages, have different presentations uh, in different languages to reach out to people because uh, Tina is right. It's, you know, we can't forget alcohol. Um, I never smoked, but you know what? Nicotine is a drug too, and it, it kills people. So if we have a Department of Health and Human Services, I'm convinced that we'll have a much better approach to all of the different health issues, nutrition, communicable diseases, uh, informational bulletins, such as this <coughs> virus that's coming over from China. We, we've just got to get it through council. It, it will be introduced. It will be debated. And I think that will enhance what, uh, what Nelson mentioned needs to be done in this city. But lastly, I would urge you to get in touch with the mayor. And those of you who are youth workers, uh, you know, he's got young children, but he doesn't know everything about all topics. So I would make an appointment with him in, in a small group setting, sit down and try to get some information to him as to where you think we should be going so that it will trickle down through uh, city government. I think this will be our last person, and, uh, and thank you for your patience, folks. I know we ran a little over. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Eva Andrade. I work for the City of Brockton, the Mayor's Office, promoting Census 2020, and I believe the Census is going to be the answer for a lot of these problems we have in the city if we are counting our residents the correct way. So if we do a good job with the census this year, our budget will increase, and then we'll have money to uh, tackle a bunch of these issues that we have in the city. We'll have money for better programs for the youth. We'll have money for, um, for the police department to create maybe the um, community police. So I need help. I need community uh, cheerleaders to help out spread the word about the census. We have an event on uh, February 26th at the War Memorial Building. So it's a formal invitation for community leaders to come over and learn about, um, it's more of a training, train the trainer is what they're calling it. And so we need leaders to come in and learn how to bring the message of the census out so we can engage the, the community so that we can be counted correctly and we have the funds uh, come into our city. What time? Uh, 7 p.m. February 26, 7 p.m. at the War Memorial Building. They can reach me at City Hall um, or through my phone, 617-908-8588. Uh, I am available for um, whatever ideas that um, the community might have that can help us um, uh, share the word. I know um, Brockton Public Schools is very engaged. We also have an event on April 1st, which is Census Day, at the new community center. Um, we're going to have teachers and paraprofessionals available uh, that speak different languages to help residents fill out the census online because that's the first step is the invitation that you will receive uh, to fill out the census online is going to come in the mail around March 12th to March 20th. Uh, so fill out the census online first. If um, people have issues, then we will be there on April 1st to help out filling out the census online. After that, uh, you will receive a second reminder to do your census online. If you, again, don't do it, then that's when the census workers uh, are going to start coming and knocking on doors and trying to help people that couldn't do it online or fill it out through the paper. Online, you have the option of doing it in 12 different languages versus the paper that only is in English or Spanish. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions regarding the census and taking away the fear uh, filling out this paperwork that a lot of the residents in Brockton have right now. And um, another misconception about the census is that uh, there's the city census going on right now as well, so don't get it confused. The federal census is important, is what's going to bring $2,400 per person into um, the city's budget. So if you don't fill the census, it's $2,400 that we lose in our city budget. So that's important 
All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Once again, my phone number is 617-908-8588. My name is Eva Andrade. Ed Miller is also here, and Ed is responsible for the jobs. If you want a job um, with the census, you want to become a census taker, uh, he's also available to take any questions and to help you fill out the paperwork. You can contact him, or you can go online, www.2020census.gov slash jobs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, so much for clarifying some of the census. And I also want to give an opportunity to Ed Miller. He has a table here today, and um, the census is hiring. So a lot of people, they're not going to be filling up the forms online, or they're not going to be going to the community center so that we can help them. So we're going to have to do the door knock in the old-fashioned way, and we need people. So if you know people who are looking for a temporary job any day of the week that they are available to work, just please contact Ad Miller. He has a table. He can answer questions. And it's actually a pretty good um, pay that they pay. So it's um, good. Yes. So uh, how much do they pay per hour? 22 to 24. Yeah, 24, 25. So it's pretty good. So make sure that you get involved. Get people to work. Anybody who's looking for a job, there's a table. And a uh, phone number to contact? No? Call the mayor's office. Call the mayor's office. <laughs> we'll get you a job. <laughs> Phone number again, 617-347-7294, contact Ed Miller at the mayor's office, get people back to work, and let's get the <laughs> census. Let's do this together. We can't be losing that 2,400. I didn't even know it was that much, so now that I know, make sure everybody is counted. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our thanks to all of you for coming. Our thanks to Brockton Community Access. Special thanks to Superintendent Michael Thomas and Chief Budget Officer Aldo Petronio and Council President Azak for joining us and our other council colleagues. Uh, we will have another one of these, a date to be announced, and we will coordinate a better outreach uh, to churches and in different languages to see if we can enhance uh, participation. So uh, we, we sincerely appreciate you taking time out of your, your night to come up here. Thank you so much. Thank you.